Thank you all for coming to the panel discussion this evening. Um, the goal is that this panel will help deepen our understanding of the current position in the long history of figurative art, as well as inspire artists to consciously direct its future. Um, I'd like to give special thanks to you know, all the panel members for coming. Uh, you know, Donald, who's been working as a critic and a curator for many decades and has helped legitimize figurative art in a somewhat hostile environment. Uh, you know, veteran figurative masters like Vincent and Julie for being here to give their input and who've helped blaze a trail for uh, younger figurative artists like Adam and myself. Um, so I think the format we're going to do is I'm just going to sort of throw questions out and, and I'd like some of the panel members to give their input. Um, you know, as m many of us know, figurative art has had a rough time here and there in, in contemporary society. We've all heard stories of young artists entering the university system that are persuaded to quit painting and, you know, people are saying things like painting is dead or is cliched or irrelevant. Um, but this is a, you know, a relatively new view, especially because painting's been around for 30,000 years. Um, so, so maybe I'll start this question off with Donald. Uh, you know, what changes have you observed uh, in the support of figurative painting over the last many decades? Well, thank you. First, let me say it's a pleasure to be here, and particularly to be on the panel with two artists I've written about in admiration, which is Julie and Vincent. I'll get around to writing about you eventually. Um, I thought, uh, rather than address the question directly, I'd approach it indirectly, and the way I thought I'd deal with this question of the rough time that figurative art had is to talk about why, uh, what art is dominant now, uh, and why figurative art hasn't been, shall we say, accepted in whatever is mainstream officially. And I thought a good example of what is dominant now, what is significant now, is a work of art that exists right now. Uh, this is a situation, of course, of many artists, many kinds of art made, so it's difficult. But right now, uh, there is in uh, Versailles a work by uh, Olafur Eliasson. Uh, it's illustrated in Time magazine. It's a waterfall. Uh, it's made mechanically. Uh, the uh, pipes are there. Uh, which support, uh, a crane supporting pipes which pump water skyward, okay? Um, and Ellie Ellison then describes it as a very Baroque creation experience and celebrates our ability to be creative. Well, first of all, what strikes me about this work is it's all publicity. It's about the public, it's about exhibitionism. Uh, it has no human relevance at all. Uh, it is cited at a place that is very prominent, famous, historically significant. So essentially, he's appropriating the significance of this place, Versailles, where the water goes into the Grand Canal. So uh, he's essentially, uh, so to say, riffing off uh, a creativity of the past that was greater than his own. Uh, the next thing is it's spectacle. It's a big spectacle. It's mechanically made. Uh, the next thing to say is his idea of Baroque, he trivializes the idea completely, it's hype, and our ability to be creative, which says absolutely nothing whatsoever. Uh, so what you have here is an art which is uh, exploitive of an environment, which is spectacle, uh, which is showbiz, show business, and you can't be an art today without being entertaining and show business. And this is very entertaining, it's amusing. Versailles is, uh, tourist destination. As we all know, cultural tourism is the big tourism today. So this gives you an added tickle when you go to Versailles. So wow, you see a waterfall over there. And is it as exciting? Uh, aren't there some waterfall sites in five corners or something like that? One of the amusement parks. So Versailles has turned into an amusement park. Art has to be amusing today. Uh, I could point out other people, uh, perhaps uh, uh, our own Jeff Coons, um, it struck me as very symptomatic when the Broad Museum opened up that the work that they had in the window was a Coons uh, and it was uh, uh, the guy with his monkey uh, who passed away, unfortunately. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson with his monkey. So it was an entertainer. So art has to be entertaining. 
it has to be part of the popular culture. And this is sort of popular. Everybody likes a waterfall, even if it's artificial waterfall. There should be a slide there, actually, would make it more participatory art, <laughs> you know. All right, so all of the things that are missing here are what I think figurative art today is trying to restore. Figurative art in this room by Odd Nerdrum, figurative art of these various people. First, a sense of intimacy. It invites you in rather than keeps you out, okay? So this art keeps you out. There's no inside to this. It's just water. The inside is a machine. It's just machine-generated waterfall. It's not even a natural waterfall. It may be symptomatic how the whole world's becoming artificial. You know, if you want, you can read all kinds of cultural meaning into it, but you can't read any art meaning, and for me, that involves some aesthetic meaning. A waterfall, you can say, has a certain aesthetic to it, if you want, but that's not any his aesthetic. He's appropriating that aesthetic. He's not done anything to the waterfall. He's not, so to say, created into it, to use the language of psychoanalyst Winnicott. There's no creation ex nihilo. Create into something. Uh, so uh, the art that we see here invites us into the picture. It invites us into a human story presented allegorically, symbolically. You can interpret it various ways. Uh, it addresses the body also. One of the things that's notoriously missing in the modern art is the sense of the body, of viscerality. There was a key moment in the history of modern art, which uh, very important in the development of abstraction, but really in the end proved disastrous, which is when Kandinsky separated the haystack from the color. Okay, The haystack was what it was. Color was what it was. Both very important. Okay. And the issue today is how do you get these back together? All right, we've refined art for the sake of art. We've had art refined, refined, refined. Perhaps the ultimate statement of the color art is Ellsworth Kelly, who passed away recently. Uh, the exhibition at San Francisco Museum of Art, nicely, interestingly shaped, strong colors. Okay, so color, color, color. We've had that going on. You can read lots of texts about the importance of color. But color of what? Okay, color of what? So the color cannot be separated from the materiality, from the bodiliness. The next thing that I think that this art offers uh, that is extremely important is not only a sense of the inside, not only a sense of the uh, uh, human figure, of the body, re-engaging the body, uh, but it offers uh, a certain sense of reflection, it invites us to reflect. It's not just an immediate sensation, which is what this is. This is all immediate. There it is. You got the waterfall. Click. Okay. Voila. You know, I take my photograph and I go home. Uh, this uh, invites us to invest our thinking into it, to mediate, to mediate with it. So I think that's the issue. Now, I would say, not to say too much more, but say one thing. The resistance to this kind of art in the art world and is the triumph of, let's call it, modernism in its variety of forms, of abstract and variety of forms, has to do with a larger issue than art. It has to do with our society. It has to do with the fact that what you have in abstract art, as brilliant as a lot of it is, okay, and I think the best abstract art gives us what I call an experience of lived sensuousness, you know, strong sensuousness, but does it conveys our alienation from ourselves. I hate to use that overword word alienation, but it conveys that. Uh, so we get this quote, supposedly higher experience, uh, refined aesthetic experience, but it separates us from the larger existential situation. What interests me about this art is it has existential relevance, it has existential value, and it reminds us that we exist despite the fact that we live in a world which seems, so to say, inimical to human existence, as we see this, in which life has become increasingly cheap, as I see it, in which there's violence and destructiveness. So there is some sense of something being preserved here that is slowly being eroded, eliminating, eliminated, uh, having uh, a problematic existence, so to say. So that would be my argument that the art world resistance, if you want to call it that, to that, uh, to, to this has partly to do with that. Also, something else about our beloved art world, uh, it, everybody talks about diversity. It is not a place of diversity. It is a place of inertial systems, okay? There's a certain belief system 
a very tired and old belief system in something called the avant-garde. Theodore Adorno, who I admire very much, said, if you wanted to call yourself avant-garde, you're just saying you're young. That's all. Okay. So you haven't matured. You haven't matured. I think that's a little ironical, overstated, but there's a certain point. So avant-garde, avant-garde. Well, what is avant-garde now? It has become a meaningless idea. There have been a number of scholars, critics, theorists who argue that it's a totally passe idea, that avant-garde ideas have been assimilated, as it were. And so the larger issue now is how do we get all this brilliant refinement of color, line, etc., all these things that have been talked about endlessly in various ways by avant-garde artists, together with the human existence, human experience, human fear. I think the artist who poses this dilemma, if I say so, is Picasso. Okay. So Picasso is split right down the middle between this, and he, he faces this, doesn't quite resolve it. Uh, you may recall years ago there was an exhibition of his work which dealt with his abstract surreal work, this is using my part, and his so-called Ang type work. Back and forth, back and forth, he didn't quite know where it goes. And he poses the dilemma, he's not the only one, but he does it in a sort of conspicuous way if you look at his work uh, overall. And also, if he didn't go towards complete abstraction, he mocked the old masters. You know that with like Rembrandt works, He's always appropriating from them, dependent on them, twisting and turning them, so acknowledge their inescapability. Okay, that's another larger issue, the inescapability of the past. And I think what we're having here now is a return to repress. That's what's going on in this exhibition. The repressed figure, the repressed body, okay, the neglect of our own particular existence. That's all I'm saying. Cool. <laughs> you want to add to it, um, Vincent? Well, I mean, um, there's so much of it I agree with. And, you know, Donald and I have known each other for quite a while now, and I respect him tremendously. The um, starting with the idea of the avant-garde. I mean, you know, I've always said that if it looks like the avant-garde and it smells like the avant-garde, then it's not the avant-garde. And it wasn't, I wasn't the only one who said that. Apparently Duchamp said something very much like that, and so did Willem de Kooning. Um, there is an incendiary brilliance to the early years of modernism that has an authenticity that uh, I, I can't be denied. And it's, uh, it's growing out of a very close memory to what the mother load of <coughs> Western art had been. There are certain modernists who I think really have attempted to uh, 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 enhance a dia their dialogue with the old masters, with not just the old masters, but previous art. There were some, art some artists, like the futurists, who were fascists, who wanted to burn the museums. And uh, those people, I think, were, were, I mean, they supported Mussolini. They were, they were animals, as far as I'm concerned. But I don't see feel that way about Picasso, and I don't feel that way about Matisse. Um, I think that one of the things we're here to talk about, I think, is the uh, future possibilities for uh, painting, uh, representational painting, figure of painting, painting of the figure. Um, and, um, you know, I've talked for a long time, and what I've actually been struck by meeting the incoming students and watching students leave the academy. Um, is the idea that um, the entire pedagogical agenda of uh, teaching students has to be revamped, painters in particular. I think that we come out of school or we go into our undergraduate training being uh, instructed by people who really are just, you know, uh, toting the line. They have certain kinds of ideas. When they're not talking about forcing the artists into conceptual agendas. They're telling them stuff about figuration and representation that I think is, is anachronistic and, and meaningless and doesn't provide equipment. I mean, let's face it, we look around us, there's a lot of representation in the world nowadays. We see yeah. it, if you just go on the internet, you look at this stuff. Now take a look at it. I mean, it does, it, the fact that it's there doesn't really mean much to me because 95% of it is just, ugh. You know, just like 95% of abstraction is terrible. So it's not an issue of whether or not it's representational or whether it's abstraction. It's an issue of painting. 
The thing that's really threatened is painting. And so to reinvest in what painting means, what it is now, you know, and understanding what it has been is a very important way in which we can sort of address mm -hmm. and face the, the future. For example, you know, um, I, th I think that we, uh, it's an important idea to, when, I'm, when I'm teaching to go back to the absolute basics of painting, of visual visualization, and to try to rewrite in a certain sense the way we have looked at certain things. Instead of, for example, Odd will just assume a position of Rembrandt or assume a position of illumination of form that comes from the Dutch Caravaggisti, eventually from Caravaggio, I would be more interested in talking to students and saying, if you want to construct a light mass on a figure, okay, where does that come from historically? What is the significance of it? Now, to use your imaginations or to apply a kind of heuristic plasticity to your understanding of this, which is kind of what painters do all the time. I mean, they, 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 they don't necessarily read the texts of history and then follow to the le letter the texts of history, you know? They don't need to justify what they do by some kind of, uh, you know, a pre-existing text or evidence that this was the case. They're keeping a ball in motion, and so they look beyond even the text. Sometimes they do it in a very stupid way, and, but, but in the best ways, they're reinventing an idea of history, an idea of how painting has been used, what the techniques of painting actually mean, and what they refer to when you apply them to your own work. You know, one of the things that we were talking about color and the separation of color from the thing. It's very important for me to say, I, I, one of the things I get in, I, I, I encounter in art schools is that, you know, the, the kids have, the kids, they're, they're adults, they have, you know, they've got all these colors. All these colors come in the kit. And they don't know what colors to use, really. And they can draw really well. Basically, drawing comes naturally to so many people. But when it comes to actually painting the stuff, they freak out. Everybody freaks out. Hey, I'm just saying this because I freaked out. I've totally, I, I could draw, I could draw. And then when it's coming to painting, it was like, oh shit, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, excuse my language. Uh, so, you know, color, how do you approach color, this vast array of colors that you're given, when you're really interested in the structure of form the way it was, you know, in, say, Caravaggio's day or Rembrandt's day, if you want to learn about that, what do you do with all those other colors, you know? Why is it that, you know, I wonder if people ask themselves, why is it that after Delacroix and after Manet, Virtually nobody of the more advanced artists ever painted a torso illuminated with three quarters light and one quarter shadow. What happened at that moment that shifted the emphasis from form and its, and its demonstration by illumination to color? And it's at that moment, and it's Delacroix who enacts that change in the journal May 5th, 1852, the painting should be constructed as if on a gray day the passage begins, that he creates the springboard that will serve as the, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, like the call of the uh, Impressionists. They no longer painted form illuminated. They painted shadow, and they painted half light. And that was what Delacroix's answer to the privilege that was ascribed to form for all of those years. That's the moment when the ultra-subjective is born. Because form always represented a kind of rational, structural marker within painting. And once form was, was deconstructed by the you know, privileging of color over that, of the half-tones and the shadows over the illuminated mass, then all of a sudden you have this idea of color and its ultra-subjective, its sensate, nature, ultra-sensate nature. Um, so what I'm saying is basically when we teach students today, we need to explain to them or at least encourage them to think about where form originated. What is the relationship between Caravaggio and linear perspective, for example? You know? Invent, invent something. Think it through and find a relationship between them. Why does mannerism exist between the Renaissance and the Baroque? What is mannerism's relationship? You know, you can't just sort of like look at the stuff and say, oh, okay, I think I'll make up a story about that. Like, uh, you can't. You need to sort of think about why 
Neoplatonism had such an important role in the development of imagery, not just imagery, but the manner of the technical narrative of paintings. You know, so the be we have to go back to the very beginning. What is color? Why do we use so many colors today? Why is color ultra subjective? Why was color always considered to be ephemeral and uh, undependable? And why is form considered to be was always considered to be stable? So if you choose to paint like odd and you choose to paint with, with a formal structure to your work that is sort of based on illumination, you may be part of a, of a group of people in the history of the world who felt that they wanted to hold on to some strange, even, even convoluted idea of reason. That reason is, takes precedence over sensation in painting, you know? Um, Anyway, I think, but that, that, that I think is where the future of this has to go. It has to be, re, the curriculum has to be rewritten. Students have to really know our history before they come to school. Uh, I don't know how many times I've had students, graduate students, who don't even know who Tintoretto is, you know? And it's like, that breaks my heart, you know? And then if you're going to make a painting, for example, if you're a scientist, you're, going to, you're an immunologist, and you're going to write a paper on immunology, you investigate everything that has possibly been written about your hypothesis before you actually pose your, present your information. Students come to art school nowadays without any idea, really, of what has gone on in the history of art and why it happened. They haven't developed their own personal narratives about how this possibly happened, you know? Why it went from here to there. Uh, who are these artists? Why did they paint this way then and not this way back, you know, uh, 10 years ago, you know? They don't know this stuff, and yet they try to reinvent the wheel. Now, it's very easy for people to come out and make spectacular displays like the fountain in Versailles, you know, this fountain thing. Um, but nothing in our culture supports the education of the painter. So painting will die. Painting will wither on the vine, you know? Uh, unless we change the course of our the pedagogical approach to teaching, to, uh, to the education of artists, and uh, we try to build an enthusiasm for serious art, serious painting. It, it could be ironic painting, it could be conceptual painting, it could be abstract painting, it could be humorous painting. But painting, what makes it painting? Why painting as opposed to something else? What is a painting? It's a void. A can empty canvas is the void you're talking about. And when you populate it with things, you're coating the void in order to protect yourself against falling into oblivion, to a kind of uh, non-identity. And so the things you populate your pictures with, the things that you do, the technical devices that you use, are means of dispelling despair, the ultimate despair of the void, you know? That's why I think odds figures float in voids often. It's because they're almost as if like they're, they're still there, they're almost like flotage of a, after the Titanic wreck, you know, floating by and they're still there, but, you know what I mean? Kind of like, I think that's about it. <laughs> Just one, one comment about what Vincent says. There are two issues that you raise. You focus on painting, okay, but you mentioned representation, okay, and they're not necessarily the same, okay. So there is a lot of representation out there. In fact, there's some terrific photographic representation of the figure, no less. So the difference, and remember when photography was invented, there were statements that painting was over, okay, that was explicit. Okay, so the question is, what does painting do? What does odds paintings of the figure do that a photograph doesn't do? Okay, mm -hmm. um, what does it do that's different also uh, than uh, what a Hollywood film could do with some of the sensationalism or the cannibalism of that work? Mm -hmm. So what does painting have to give us that uh, we can't get uh, through, uh, say, an ordinary photograph, even a highly refined, elegant photograph? An urgency. An absolute urgency of application. That has to do with touch. That has to do with touch. touch. That has to do with the intimacy. With the haptic that has to sense. Do. Exactly. And the question is how you do it. But photography can do fantastic things with light and dark right, as well, with, with nuance of that. that. So I'm just pointing out that there's an issue here that, in fact, there has been a lot of, quote, representational art, but it's in this thing called photography. And I think one of the reasons that for a long part of its history, photography has been regarded as secondary to painting is because it was made supposedly just by a machine, not by the hand, okay? And that, of course, is debatable. 
Okay, this is an I involved in both of them. But but truly, yeah. yeah I, I would say that it's it's more than just touch. That um, uh, I'm sure we all started using the photograph when we were young painters, and when we started to learn something about how to put a paint a picture together, we quickly learned that the photograph had its own um, set of exigencies that didn't conform to our own. Um, and so that has to do with some kind of, of, of mapping of, you know, how, how the brain works, how um, mm -hmm. thought is, is uh, captured in form, along with the touch idea um, that's obviously really important too. Uh, but the, the, the thing that I um, think is really important to add to this conversation is the, um, the notion of how, how the conversation about figurative art is, is changing and growing, mm -hmm. and what, we, what, what went awry probably in the 19th century um, with the French lawn painters, the academic painters, the Bougarros, mm -hmm. and how somebody like Gustave Moreau was trying desperately to both be an academic painter, but he was on the cusp of um, modernism. And so you can see in his work this kind of marvelous schizophrenia as he's trying to make sense of both these, these ideas. But the crux of it is that that the, the 19th century, um, you know, those exquisite 20 foot tall, glorious academic paintings were essentially a big lie. And, um, and the, the budding avant-gardists, the budding modernists could see that. And so somebody like Odilon Redon comes along and he makes these tiny little paintings that are just a glow of color. And we feel as though he's telling us something real about this sort of majesty of interiority versus um, you know, David's painting of Napoleon, which mm -hmm. is just such an overcompensation for the fact that he was a, kind of a puny tyrant. That was, his painting was a lie. Um, um, Bonnard uh, recognized that he had no conception of uh, what constitutes a female. So he didn't try to paint a female the way that, that we see here, or the way that Bouguereau did, which is just some kind of prettification. He recognized that he didn't have a, a clue about the, the weird interiority of, of a woman, and so he painted the truth of that, which was a, a kind of an awkward, um, sort of nutty figure that was the closest he could get to, mm -hmm. to trying to understand this interiority. Yeah, um, yeah. I was going to throw a question to Adam about uh, history painting. I mean, it, it sounds like there's almost a kind of a fear of history painting and that, you know... Well, I think there is. I see a similarity there, actually, with kind of the direction everybody's gone, in that when I look at 19th century painting, particularly, um, you know, Napoleon III from that era, and you start to see these big academic paintings, there's a similarity. And one of the similarities I see with the piece at Versailles we were discussing earlier is we live in a moment now where you have what you could call hedonistic capitalism. And it's almost an imperative with some of these new shiny pieces. It's like you will stop thinking and have a good time and spend your money. That's it. That's why they love to put them in Versailles. It's like a statement of power. And if you create this world that's devoid of history, that all of the potential problems, all of the potential dark things aren't really out there, at least not in your world, you can project them onto the other, whether it's the barbarian at the gates, whoever it is, and you live in this clean, pristine world, those kind of things are upsetting. And I was thinking about them, and that basically transitions the artist from that old kind of strange priest role they took on at some point when Christianity sort of lost a lot of its uh, power, mm -hmm. and it puts them into the role of an entertainer. And not just an entertainer, an entertainer serving a particular agenda, a particular political agenda that's very powerful in the world right now. And I was going, hmm, so what do we do with that? When was the last time that happened? And I went, aha, Napoleon III. That was a time where artists were entertainers. And to me, I'm not quite as hard on all those artists because I love walking around Paris. I love seeing the, um, well, butcher the French here, I'd say the Pont Alexander and the Petit Palais and all these buildings. They're glorious, they're magnificent. And so I do think there is room to do things, even though that's the new paradigm, and it doesn't seem to be going away. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, I think they're really afraid of darkness. I think they're really afraid of reminders of what makes us human and our history and where we come from. Mm -hmm. And the things that will start to remind us, like, yes, we are particular people with particular failings and histories, and we're not just consuming machines. We're not just people that can be simplified into an algorithm. 
and told to do whatever you want. So that's my take. Well, you have the Nicole Eisenman show up right now, and she's clearly, uh, it's well attended, and she's clearly not afraid of the darkness, and her her visitors are not afraid of the darkness that she paints about. And I think the reason that she's not afraid and we're not afraid is that she recognizes that we have to approach this idea of figuration with the recognition that we are not at the, at the top of our game anymore, so we're not masters of the universe, and that we're all really, really, really different. And so she paints all of her people really, 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 really different, where these people, they just look the same. And I think that that's the problem with, with uh, academic figuration, is that we just, we've seen that kind of face so many times that um, it's, it's not telling us anything new. And we go to art to tell us something that wakes us up. Well, I, 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 one of the things that always troubles me about, um, I, I agree with what you're saying, what, but one of the things that always troubles me uh, is uh, how people emphasize the subject matter of a painting over the technical story of the painting. There's one story going on that's a dramatic narrative, and there's another story that's probably for painters at least, and I think subliminally uh, you know, absorbed by the public. Uh, the other story, which is more important, which is the technical narrative, the way the story unfolds with the paint. And if we focus really on the, the, the dramatic narrative of things, we misunderstand everything that is glorious about painting. We don't, we don't even come close to the mind of the painter. Like in the Renaissance, how many more crucifixions do you need? How many more Madonnas do you need? How many more Pietas do you need? You know, these artists weren't like enthralled with their subject matter, so they had to do something with their intelligence because they weren't as unless, uh, uh, um, as opposed to the way they're often presented, as people, well, we had to do the commission, so we're just a workaday artist. No, they were people with great minds. Pontormo was a man with a great mind. You know, when he painted the deposition, he didn't want to paint it like any other deposition that had ever been painted. Why? Oh, well, he wanted to call attention to himself so he could get more commissions. Come on. It's not, everything is not, you know, reducible to some kind of material dialectic, you know? There was something inside of him that he wanted to convey with the manipulation of the material, right? The manipulation of materials. The story of the paint, the story of his thought exists in the manipulation of materials, not the fact that it's a deposition, you know? If someone said to me, what would you rather see, a photograph of Michelangelo? or a painting of, some, of, by, of Michelangelo by somebody who knew him really well, I ask my students that, and they think it's a trick question, and it kind of is, and I say, yeah, I'd rather see the photograph of Michelangelo. God damn it, I want to see what the guy looked like. I want to see what his face really looked like. But it won't tell me anything about his mind. If I want to know his mind, I have to look at his work. And it's not just, oh, he chose to paint night, I mean, the emphasis on iconography, which was how art history really was born, in a sense, was emphasizing the iconographic, because it was theorizable, it was actually kind of demonstra de de demonstrable. <laughs> there also is the technical dialogue that's in here. If you look at Penovsky, was doing the same thing, the two dialogues. Right. Two and histories were going on. And it, this is, it's, it's very important. When we go to like the museum, I've said this before, we go to the museum, and like, you know, on one side you see the Turboch and the uh, uh, Jan Steen and the De Hook, the little Dutch masters. And on the other side, you see some Vermeers, you know? When you go to look at the, the other <coughs> Dutch masters, not the Vermeers, they really, they do pose the question, what's going on in this picture? You know, what, what is that letter that she's being handed? You know, all of this stuff. You look at the Vermeers and really, you don't think about what that letter is at first. You just don't think about it. There's something else. We go close to them. We can't understand why all the Dutch masters, they all had access to the camera obscura. Why is Vermeer the only one who paints the distortion of the lens? Not just parameter, parameter distortion, but the beams of light. Why is he the only one who does it? Well, but let's add to that. I, I, you're, you're, you're a surface man. Your surfaces are beautiful. But um, with, with Vermeer, those are glorious surfaces. We all know that. But it's, and excuse my students who have heard this before, but you know, woman with the balance. Where 
that, um, you know, with all those little triangles, where that central triangle is that um, tells you what the uh, central question of the painting is, where, you know, how do we assess um, uh, uh, satisfaction? Um, is it earth? How, how, how do we parse um, uh, where we go to for satisfaction, through earthly pleasures or through the divine? And he has that central little marvelous triangle of the dots and the fingers that point you up. So that goes beyond surface to um, the exquisiteness of his compositions. I, I favor composition over, that's true. over surface. That, that's true, but, but to, to look deeper into why the lens and why, why he's obsessed with the lens over other things, I think that you have to really understand how, uh, his, I think one has to think about how historically uh, the Neoplatonic tradition came from Italy through the manners and through Caravaggio to the Caravaggisti, the Dutch Caravaggisti, and how Rembrandt actually riffing on the night, the, uh, with his night watch on, on the School of Athens, saying that I can paint a perspective using only light, but I don't need to have uh, the orthogonals and the traversals that Raphael depended on to make his, his space. You know, the thing is that um, in Vermeer, um, what you have is uh, him constantly painting the women in his life, his wife, his daughters, and they always carry within the accoutrements, the, the uh, uh, accessories of Venus. They carry, they have pearls, they have mirrors, there's sometimes little dogs attached to them. Even the one in the men, of, this, of the one that they call the drunken maid, Venus was sleeping and Bacchus and Ceres woke her up, bringing her wine and fruit, which is what is there. The painting behind her is an allegory of love. Vermeer painted a, painted a man out that could have been Ceres or, or it could have been uh, Bacchus in the background, put a mirror back there and took the dog out, which is another symbol of Venus, and put the chair there. So what it is, is if you look at paintings of Venus, the gaze of Venus, you know, where she's looking in her mirror, the mirror is generally tipped in Velazquez, in uh, Rubens, and in, um, and in Titian. The mirror is tipped so that Venus is looking at you, not at herself. We're not voyeurs looking at Venus. Her gaze is transfixing us. This is why the business of the, you know, uh, the Olympia, she's, he's, she's looking straight at you. Venus does look at you. Venus looks at you because she's telling you that you have to look at me because I am the focus of what the artist does. Beauty, love, truth, all embodied into one. So when Vermeer uses the lens as a mediating factor between himself in the darkened camera obscure room of the, you know, of the obscure, the darkened room where the thing is, and the subject is on the other side of that, you know, the letters that get passed between Vermeer and, the, uh, and Venus, the, the communication is mitigated by the, the lens. And therefore, the, 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 just like the vision the, is mitigated by the surface of the mirror or the painting in the Venus pictures. So when they're reading letters, they're reading communications, I think, between, between the artist and Venus. But now they have to be done as a correspondence because they're done through the mediating you know, uh, element of the lens, which is the oculus, which returns again to Brunelleschi and the birth of perspective. Well, let's just say something simpler, Vincent. Uh, maybe it had to do with Luino, Luino, the microscope. Okay, maybe it had to do with what they're telling us about painting. It's about seeing. So it's all about seeing. Okay, that's what the mirror is. Uh, I think a climactic example of that for me is Cabo, where you have these figures looking out onto the world, onto the scene. I also think uh, that uh, there's no art, uh, whether you want to do it from the technical discourse uh, or from the narrative discourse or iconographic discourse, which is not in some sense a response to something that is not art. Okay, uh, It can be some kind of uh, sensation, some experience, some object out there. It's always there. It's a false dichotomy that you've set up there. Uh, and I would just say about uh, Eisenman, um, Eisenman you know, is interesting, but she's dealing with a cliched idea of surrealism, basically. It's quite interesting. Uh, she carries it forward into another context. Uh, I agree completely with Winnicott. There's no originality except on the basis of tradition. That's the tradition uh, she's coming from. I would also say about David, uh, about the Napoleon, uh, uh, I think it's an absolutely mad painting. 
It's an extraordinary painting. Uh, it's, uh, it's rather brilliant in its coloring and whatnot. And I think in general he had a real awareness of uh, the insanity of what was going on around him, and he was a great survivor, which I admire very much uh, as well. I also remind you about uh, Louis Napoleon. Uh, it was he, together with the Baron Haussmann, that gave us the Paris we have today. Okay, uh, the four, uh, 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 the four uh, forests were his idea. All kinds of things. I could rattle them off. There's no point. Okay. Uh, you, they, they were one after the other. The Paris that is constructed today is completely his concept. The uniform buildings, etc., etc., etc. The look, all of that is his. He was a great visionary. Also, it, it sort of didn't put the kibosh on the, on the, the commune. And, uh, it was partly about that, but it was also, <laughs> hang on one moment. Oh, it's okay. part of the evidence. There's no doubt it was, it was that the commune was defeated there, but it was also that Paris had been a small city of about 300,000 people. It was expanding enormously. There had to be new residents. These things are always contradictory. There's no one way of looking at it. Um, uh, just as I agree completely about hedonistic capitalism, but the fact of the matter, we're all part of hedonistic capitalism. That is, we are making products uh, that are there to give us pleasure and uh, to uh, sell, to survive, okay? So the question is how do you negotiate that in terms of your own psyche and how do you give people a pleasure that maybe they didn't know that was there to be had, uh, so to say. But I don't think there's any way to escape tradition, including the tradition of the new, as Baudelaire called it. All traditional now, there's no escape from that. So the question is what do you use from tradition to build your own structure? Uh, that's, that, that's all I say. And I think that photography has to be taken extremely seriously. Uh, during the Weimar Republic, there was some extremely brilliant abstract photography. Um, photography opened the way, I think, to light in many ways. I frankly think that there's an, uninvestigated, uh, a, a, an investigation into Delacroix, his awareness of photography as well. I'm absolutely convinced of that, just as Degas was aware of photography. Uh, quite, quite explicitly. So these things are a little more complicated and what I'm suggesting is that painting has to enrich itself with other sources. The problem with odds paintings, if you want, okay, is they don't do that. Okay? They don't quite do that. Uh, and they have uh, hang on to a rather limited palette uh, and uh, they have uh, a certain recurrent kind of theme maybe, as Vincent says, hanging on to reason uh, rather than subjective, although he's trying to, so to say, uh, present, I think, a certain kind of subjective experience. Uh, but he is not fully aware of other sources of vision, if you want, that I think uh, virtually all the major modern masters were aware of. So, so, so what is it going to take to progress figurative painting you know, now? Do you think like what are what's important to consider? I don't know the word uh, progress, what it means uh, okay. exactly, but I do agree with Vincent that there are a great deal of shortcomings in education. True. Uh, that there are hobby horses that are being ridden in art schools. I remember uh, George Siegel saying to me when he was in art school that he wanted to do figures, and the professor said, "No, no, you can't do figures. It has to be abstract. It has to be abstract." Mm -hmm. I've heard this right. Before. So he, he eventually did his figures, but you know, so that there are, uh, so to say, ideologies that are laid down in art school, and also, if I may say so, uh, there is the limitation of the teacher who is trained in a certain way and wants to perpetuate that way of doing things, okay? Now that may be fine, but my idea of art school is Vincent's to one extent, but also I truly believe the Bauhaus model is the best model that is, you learn, you have an apprenticeship initially, okay? You learn how to work in every medium possible, whatever it is, old oak glass. Remember, Albers was a glass master at the Bauhaus, okay? You learn everything you possibly can, and then you work with the master trying to develop your own identity, as it were. And I think what can happen is my own thought is that the process of the actualization of the significant art involves the process of self-actualization of a significant sense of self. The two are separate. You're making yourself as you're making the art in some way. 
or you're having a certain kind of experience. And I believe that the best art uh, when the modernist traditions comes from what has been called the peak experience, a certain kind of fusing of different levels of experience and a kind of peak experience. And that comes with maturity. Uh, there are prodigies. I mean, you have Chopin, who's doing extraordinary things. You know, yeah, I mean, it depends. But uh, I think a lot of the problems, if go back to Mr. Olsen, is really it's profoundly infantile and simple-minded. You know, it's really just sort of dumb stuff to just put up a, you know, all this trouble and energy and money uh, to put up this waterfall. It's like Richard Serra's rusted cans, you know, it's just sort of all that cranes, everything's in the effort in the cranes, in the effort, the mechanics. Wow, look what I'm doing. I've got a big crane now, and I'm lifting this big piece of thing, and it's going to rust. Wow, you know. Uh, geez. And then you see this, and you move around it a little bit, and wow, you're intimidated. Yeah. So okay. don't you think I that's think just a big celebration of, you know, the ordinary in a way? It's, it's a celebration like something that of comes out of, you know, the realism and then into Duchamp and then like this. Partly yeah. that, but I think Richard Serra is a dead-end industrialist artist, basically. He's the end of manufacturing art. He's sort of uh, the gravestone of, uh, of, of industrialism in art. You know, <laughs> you know, all this mechanical interest in the mechanical, those are sort of big gravestones or mausoleums, you know, etc. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, in, you know, I'm not talking about Richard Serra particularly. I'm talking about these rusted things, and I have to tell you that I'm responding to something that offended me uh, deeply, uh, which may be my own limitation and perception. But at the opening of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, you may recall there are the three big Richard Serra. Why the yeah. fuck do they need Richard Serra's in there when there are a lot of other things? And why? Because it's a market, because of Mr. Gagosian, because of they don't know what else to do. You know, they want to be safe. They want to show we are trendy. Trendy is not avant-garde. You know, trendy yeah. is marketable. So it's sort, sort of the new um, academic art in a way. I yes, mean, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, one thing coming back to, you mentioned photography and Nicole Eisenman and academic figure painting, and I'll stand up a little bit for academic figure painting here, because that's my job. Um, so I think that there's something very focused, and you talk about the unification of the faces that's very similar in a lot of these pieces, and I think that's actually not just academic figurism or academic figurative art. I think that goes back a long way. I think when you look at Michelangelo, a lot of his people are very similar. They have a it's a bit, gravity's a little heavier in his world. They're bent over. They're struggling under the weight. They're standing up. They're even a little heavier. It's like they're on a planet where the gravity, the weight of life, Michelangelo, of course, the weight of life is weighing on you. Pontormo. Everybody's twisting and elongated and moving and spiraling like tops. And occasionally, if they stop moving, they fall on the floor. There's just these weird worlds they create and they inhabit, and they're very unified and they're very obsessive about it, I think, in a lot of great figurative art. And when you get to Nicole Eisenman and also photography, I think you now into a realm where there's a lot more variety. Like we were talking about, the, yeah. what's coming from the outside is much greater than what's coming from the inside. And I think there is the real danger of something getting lost in that process, too. There's something very powerful and very focused in the great academic figurative artists that I don't think you really see anywhere else, and I think it's very revealing of what actually is happening inside of the particular artist, which kind of echoes what's going on inside of most other people, you know? Well, what you're saying is predicated on the idea that, that they're engaging with the space around them in order for them to swirl. But if they aren't engaging in the space around them, which these aren't, they're basically just f figures in front and then a lot of kind of gauzy stuff behind, um, then you have basically a situation where it's, there, there, there's no complexification of the space. And it's, it's through the space that um, a, a complicated world where background parses middle ground, which parses foreground and back and forth, you know, you get the filmic equivalent of a story in, in, mm -hmm. in space as opposed to, to, from, to, to linearly. Um, and that's when things get interesting. And when it's, when it's not doing that, then I think the, the artist has dropped the ball. Because, because then it becomes just, just human-centered. It's just about, you know, these human bodies that we, we've looked at and looked at and looked at, it as, as I was saying before, and not about our relationship to, uh, to our environment. See, I wonder about that. That's really interesting, because one thing I've noticed about Odd's paintings as he's gotten older, too, it's a similar process that I see in a lot of artists as they get older over the years. You know, Titian, 
Rembrandt, Goya, it seems to be that late stage where things get simpler, more compressed, the palette shrinks, the definition of edges and forms becomes starts to dissolve almost. And I do wonder if that is partly like a later stage of painting, you know, in terms of how old you are as a painter. As you get older, like for me, I love the complexity. I can't get enough of it. And we actually had a discussion with Odd when I was with him, and I was saying, you know, he looked at me, and I just come back from the Louvre, and he said, oh, what was your favorite piece? And I went, oh, man, I just loved the raft of Medusa. That piece was so exciting. It was so dynamic. He went, oh, Americans, Hollywood, you love the big special effects. You know, and he was saying, I'm at a point in my life where things are kind of going more inwards, more quiet. All of that is dissolving. And so I do wonder, like, if that's not something that happens as an artist, maybe starts to dis disengage a little bit from the rest of the world, and they start to look at things in a little more interior way. I mean, you know, so, so we're looking at Odd's paintings as an, as an older man now, and uh, we, uh, if you remember how crisp and pristine his earlier paintings were, uh, how spatially, you know, alarming they were sometimes, uh, you know, he, he went there, he did that, he enjoyed all of that. Um, yeah, I think that there is something about these paintings that is foggy and, uh, and it's just too murky. And I, but I also see this, again, I do see it in late Titian, you know. Um, I wonder if what you wind up doing is reaching the kind of, uh, the end of tonality in a way, where you felt you've completely explored the, 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 the power of strong tonality, but you haven't investigated color yet to any uh, significant way, in any significant way. I know when he does his lighter pictures, and I, know, I can almost imagine him forcing himself to do them, or doing them and thinking, this is color, now I'm using color. And color is opening up a door outside of this, this really, really you know, constricted uh, tonal closure that he, you know, enclosure that he's built around himself. Uh, you know, I, in, the end, in the end, you've got a man who's, what, is he 70 some years old now? You know? And, and he, he's painted all his life with all of his heart with all of his heart, and yeah, he goes around dressing like, you know, some god or whatever. Uh, he's also in a situation politically where, you know, he's in a, a culture that is ultra-conformist in a lot of ways, and so he makes a real point of being different than everybody else. You have to admire him, you have to admire this, and I remember, see, when I first, when I, when I first met him, or, or first saw his work, I really hated it. And uh, when I first met him, I was a snide, you know, and I sort of was like, I was an ass, you know? Um, over the years, I've come to respect him tremendously. And I know that there are some paintings that he did that are just absolutely beautiful. Like the one with the three figures dancing frantically across singing, or the one that's seen from above of the people lying on the ground, opening their mouths singing. I mean, there's, these are really authentic pieces of painting. So some of them are not so good. But look at the Pauline frescoes of Michelangelo. They really suck, you know? And there are aspects of The Last Judgment that are so cacophonous that you just can't even wrap your brain around them anymore. And yet, he was able to pull off Moses, you know, or the Medici tombs, you know? Um, some of Titian's paintings really are bad. I think the only person who never did bad paintings was Velazquez. Okay. Let me just say something about Odd. I, I, I've known Odd for over 40 years. I met him in Oslo, spent some time together. Uh, he was very vigorous, and I always felt, and what initially engaged me, uh, was some of the political work, the boat people, for example, which I think is extraordinary. The last time I saw him, I told him to go back to that. That was dealing with something outside of himself. And as time went on, he began to get more inside of himself, dealing with these things. Now, one of the things that psychologists of various kinds have said about going older, as you get older, you tend to want to epitomize where you've been. You want to sort of sum it up, as it were, tighten it up. And my own opinion is these works are failed epitomizations of where he's been, OK? They try, but they don't quite come off. And I'm saying that based on my memory, which I hope is a good one, I think it's still good, of a number of his works that I've seen, which I admire very much. Okay, So it's not just, uh, say, a loss of strength, a loss of energy, uh, 
a, a loss of sense of purpose. It's not just that he's cliching himself. He's trying to epitomize himself, and it doesn't work, okay? And this is all apart from his uh, persona, so to say, his outsider appearance, uh, and uh, this absurdity of using the word kitsch to describe what he's doing, his uh, idea of epate le bourgeois, which turns out to be the king of bourgeois. Uh, you know, uh, Nietzsche always said that the, the bourgeois love being bitten, it just sort of slap you down like a mosquito or put you in a little cage or so forth. But I think that's Odd's problem. Um, uh, it doesn't have to happen that way. Think of Matisse, the modern artist, what he does later on, the way he epitomizes where he's been and comes out somewhere new, okay? Uh, I think, uh, you know, it depends on who you are and where you are. In my opinion, uh, I'm speaking about Odd, and this is my, so to say, personal or subjective opinion. Odd has alienated himself too much from his society to be able to understand who he himself is any longer, okay? So he's given up citizenship, moved to Iceland, isolated himself. He's no longer Norwegian citizen. He's in this legal situation. But, you know, alienation is a kind of cliche also, and particularly a kind of deliberate alienation, which in my opinion comes from some kind of deep personal disturbance, something traumatic going on there. What? I don't know. I don't know uh, the whole thing. But I do remember enjoying going through uh, museums in Oslo and pointing out how traditional monk was and all the old modern masters were. So uh, Odd has a problem, okay, and my own thought uh, is that if Odd would move back to Oslo, uh, which he may have to do um, willingly, uh, his, uh, his work would, shall we say, uh, be able to have the concentration that he wants to have. No, that's my own thought. V v Vince uh, used the word authentic about mm -hmm. Odd. And to me, if you're going through the problems that he's going through, yeah. which you know, you're know you alluding to, it will come out in your work. Right. And, and, and if it doesn't come out in your work, which I don't believe it is, because I, I, th this work could exist at any point in his career as far, I mean, I didn't get a chance to look at it too closely, um, it, it will come out in the work. No, it's late so, work. Like it couldn't exist at any point in his work, but I agree with you that the issues don't come out. The issues that he's confronting, confronting now. Out. Absolutely no. not. And 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 I I almost wonder. I mean, the he he grabbed on to to Rembrandt early on, and he kind of rode that wave. And I don't feel as though. I know him, and and you you know, D Donald, you mentioned that uh, Nicole's work is cliched. Um, not in a negative sense. She's working in a certain tradition. Well, okay. Okay. Yeah, well, that that's I'd like different to from a cliche. That word cliche at some point. Like when when is it cliche and when is it archetype? Like uh, I talked to Adam a little bit about that. It's you know, um, Adam mentioned that it, it's kind of a matter of like whether or not you trust the artist. Um, yeah, whether or not there's a connect between the viewer and the artist on that matter. Yeah. I think if you come out it's and you a have a cliche thing. and the cliche is met with acceptance by the viewer because the structure that it's being presented in accepts that cliche, then it's considered an archetype. And, and, and it's, it's a similar, like the, the difference between like a rioter and, and a freedom fighter, you know, for example. Yeah, what's the difference between a terrorist and a freedom fighter? Cliche means an idea has become reified, it's reified, it's static. Uh, it doesn't do anything. An archetype continues to have resonance. You could say about these works that they've lost their resonance, okay? And in that sense, you could say that cliched, although it, that's a little tricky, I we could argue more subtly, but that would be the difference I'd make. So then you would say that Nicole's work is not cliched, because uh, it, it has not gotten static. It, it's not idea. static, but it's <laughs> in a tradition. Uh, but um, uh, all I would say is uh, it has uh, it has the uh, the credibility of its limits. Yeah. So, so wor working within this uh, figurative tradition that is has such you know deep historical roots is, is it's full of pit holes and challenges and how do you navigate this crazy asteroid field and like come out not being called cliche or you know, irrelevant uh, you know how. How does one make work today that is contributing to the tradition that will be, you know, appreciated in the future that can actually have use to society? I don't think you can really teach anyone to do that. 
Right. I think that uh, there are people who will n will know how to do that, like Michael Jordan knows how to <laughs> place that, fly through the air and place that basket. Uh, a lot of it is, goes down to the old idea of talent, which is more of a, not just simply skill, but, uh, you know, asking yourself what makes a masterpiece? What is, t what is, uh, what is technical mastery? And, you know, people will say that, oh, someone like John Curran, he's technically masterful. But that's not what technical mastery is for me. Technical mastery for me is, uh, it's, it's something that, it, when a person does something that works in a manner over and over that seems to be on the cusp of failing, that's on the cusp of falling apart, and yet it doesn't. You know, stretching it to that limit, like Beethoven in the Gross Fuga, or Michelangelo in, you know, his late work, you know, Rembrandt in his late work. What I think Odd is trying to do here, but he says, I think I agree with Donald, he's, he's not quite accomplishing it. You know, they are failing. They are collapsing. Um, you know, it, it, the, the, that French academic work that, you know, um, I loathe with all of my heart. Uh, but uh, I know that there's some interesting things about it, I guess, in a way. But, uh, you know, it, it's all done with a safety net. Everything has a safety net under it. And one thing about Odd is that he, did, he worked for years with no safety net. Oh, this is utterly safety net. Everything about no, it is this, safety net. Th this is different. I think that for him to do, it's not, no, it's, it wasn't safety net. First of all, he was working on in a way that before any of us were born, practically, <laughs> you know, trying to imbue the void with figures that he actually loved and believed in. Yes, they were Rembrandt. And that's the question is, why so much Rembrandt? You know, Rembrandt came kind of later. Some of the early stuff is not quite Rembrandt. There's a lot of Caravaggio kind of in it, too. And there's the murder of Andreas Bader. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it seems that a lot of uh, figurative work that is held to you know, very high esteem today it either you know has has some sort of veil of irony over uh, sort of sincere intentions. It seems to me, and you know, Odd's work doesn't have that, so it's more uh, exposed to criticism and attack. In, well, in what, I, what I first said about Odd when I was interviewed one time is that I found it snide that I found it ironic. That I said that to paint in a manner that was a pastiche of Rembrandt was almost to do a disservice to the entire mother load of the history of art. Mm -hmm. As if to say the only way these ideas can be accessed is through a Rembrandt-esque formal sense. However, now, with more respect for the man, because I do respect him, you know, and having talked to him and watched his eyes twinkle and realized that he's a provocateur more than a many, he's a real provocateur. Yeah. I think. He's authentic, but he wants to provoke. And if in a world where there's no acknowledgement, really, in any serious way of anything pre-modern, he all of a sudden comes out and says, well, you know, screw it. I'm going to paint Rembrandt figures because I love Rembrandt. And I'm going to point, I'm going to force the issue that this stuff can be reinvestigated. Even though yeah. I might fail at this, even though this will not fly in the end, I know he wants it to, but if it doesn't, still it will raise the issue and it will bring us here talking about it at least. Yeah. You know? But I'll say a good is, word is about, about uh, the French academicians, okay? Um, they, uh, first of all, had mastered a grand tradition, okay? They may have reified it, over objectified it, but they were masters of it, okay? Mm. They were also, if I may say, highly skilled at what they were doing. Uh, that's you don't agree. I, I totally disagree. Yeah, I don't think that's what not your kind of skill is. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, skill is like yeah. I mean, it's, it's it, you can sharpen a knife too, and that's skill. But it's about the same amount. A of lot skill. of people don't know how to sharpen knives. And you can teach them a chimpanzee. <laughs> I really think you could teach. They just buy them in a store. Why do you Why do you think there's this amazing uh, uh, array of uh, ateliers around now, where people who need that needs to be, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, uh, comforted by the fact that if they learn, if they do the drop line, if they measure, if they do all of this, if they do the Florentine Academy shading, all this stuff, that everything will be all right. It's, it's a prison. It's That's a prison. It is a prison. It's very you different don't, you don't really like century. them because they don't have the subjectivity right. that you want Content. from Delacroix. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I like Ang. It, it's, it's, you have to get to this idea that the past is a different country. Okay. 
You have to see them in the world they came from, okay? And in that world, they're not observed. Things changed for all kinds of reasons, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but you know, the thing, is, the thing is that in every given time, there are legions of people who are doing what the times require. Mm -hmm. And then there are those strange individuals who are doing not what the times require. And they're painting sometimes with eyes in the backs of their heads, like, like, like de Kooning, like Picasso, like yeah. Delacroix, you know? And yet, they become ironically emblematic of their times. Well, tell me what do the times require now? I think what do the times require? Right, that's they a first guy painting what the times don't require. Who said they were doing what the times require? No, I agree. I'm saying that no, the, these paintings, one of the reasons I respect them is that they're absolutely not what the times require. You know, they don't, they're, they're like, uh, they're like dreams. I'll tell you what, I was, I was talking to David the other day, and I was saying that, you know, I started painting, I was training at the academy, uh, I was an abstract painter the whole time I was at, in school. And I had no interest whatsoever in painting the figure. Uh, I thought it was like the absolute dumbest thing to do. I'm not going to do this. And, uh, and then I kind of reached the limit of something, realizing that I, was being, I had been programmed to a certain extent to accept a certain, certain aesthetic conditions and to reject other ones. And so I asked myself, can I really reject those traditions? Shall I just, as a test, see if I can make a representational picture, which I found to be incredibly difficult, but I made this giant picture of figures around the deathbed. And then when I came to New York, I thought, you know what would be the thing to do? It would be, and uh, it was, what if in this world, in this art world, suddenly these giant history paintings, postmodern history paintings just appeared in the gallery? And my thinking was kind of like in uh, 2001, Stanley Kubrick's 2001, when the pod arrives in that sort of Georgian, you know, that sort of Age of Enlightenment room. The bizarreness of a pod, which is an eyeball, really, if you mm -hmm. want to extend the metaphor, you know, is inside of this age, this room of the Age of Enlightenment, where the eye was king and empiricism was king. I, I wanted the incongruity of paintings like that to be present in this world, you know? And um, at first, it was. Yeah, there was, I, I was really interested in it, but I was also involved in the showmanship of it at the time. But as time went on, I started to hate the way the paintings looked because I didn't know, didn't feel like I knew what I was doing. I wasn't able to get what I wanted. I wanted the materials to start to do things beyond the imagery. And I didn't want to knock a painting off, like a 10-foot painting off in a month or you know, a few weeks, you know? I wanted to just spend more time with it. And by, by flukes of, of, of chance, in my studio, when I got dissatisfied with something and pulled something over, the whole thing had glazed, and then, well, it unified it, but now it's all this. And then I sort of started hitting it with light in the light again, and I went, whoa, because the light floated on top of the transparency, and it was so cold in comparison to the warmth of the transparency, and I thought, what the hell is this? You know, so I started then floating transparency, or floating opacities on top of transparencies, and modifying them so that as they turned into the transparency, and then the transparency was, was, was gently, you know, layered over, all of a sudden the tactile, the haptic, or the, the sort of sense, sense of the paint mm -hmm. started to move me, and I realized that I didn't want to paint. At the same time, my son got, I had a stroke when he was three, mm -hmm. and I was sort of like in this position where it's like, you know, I don't really want to be a smart-ass, postmodern, you know, guy anymore. You know, uh, there's, there, there's got to be something else. There's no, it's not all the same thing. You know, there's no, there is a hierarchy. I can't, like, decide to have a cup of tea when Sam has a seizure. I, I have to address that he's having a seizure. So, therefore, there is a hierarchy, and that hierarchy is an urgency. It was an exigence. So I started to say, what then could I identify as the exigence in the void of the canvas? What do I need to address with all of my heart, you know? Whether or not it's going to, thinking never about what it's going to sell. And having, and having done that, my paintings don't sell as a result because they're too big and they're difficult. But I don't care. I'll teach to make money. I'll do something, I'll clean toilets to make money. So I want to escape the capital, the painting within the capitalist model. I don't think we have to just make products to sell. We, we put products out there, put our paintings out there to, and, 
first of all, to enlighten ourselves. Secondarily, if other people see them and, and get what you're doing to some extent, they might enjoy them or get something out of them. But primarily, it's I need to enlighten myself. Yes, and, you're creating yourself. And other people who will see it. Yeah. Paint, I mean, because people won't do it if they don't see it. If they see it, who's done it, who's alive. If they see an example of it, they might say, "My God, it can be done." But is it is it also possible to? Um, I mean, yeah, there there is this sort of um, there's the the technical narrative, and then there's the you know the subjective narrative. Can we? Is there a way that you know painting might be able to sort of um, reach out and address, I don't know, even like moral issues in society? I mean, can I, we I do that it, without like going too if, far away from ourselves? I think if a person feels a moral responsibility in society, they will make pictures that in some way are encoded with their moral responsibility in one way or another without obviously making a picture. I have students who, they're very religious and I respect them for their relig the religious beliefs and they want to make religious paintings. And I say to them, well, the last thing you want to do is make a painting that's going to sort of like, you know, be an illustration of the Bible because nobody is going to get it. If you want to, and, and I had this discussion with Sue Poe too about political art, mm -hmm. you know, is that, if you make a painting of, say, you know, uh, Donald Trump, you know, as a pig, sure, there are going to be a lot of us are going to go, yes, that's right, he is a pig, and some people will say, no, he's not a pig, but you're not going to have solved anything. Right. If, however, you make start to make work that changes, attempts to ev evoke a change in the sensibility of human beings, yeah. by, and that's why the technical narrative becomes incredibly important because it floats beneath the radar, yeah. it seeps into your imagination. You know, if you can evoke a change in sensibility and try to do that, that's the best we can do morally. Just to say, Vincent, that the change in sensibility, the, if you want your breakthrough, is connected with the trauma, okay? It's connected with the trauma of your son, which I know a certain amount about, okay? And, uh, but landing on the right side of the trauma. Because well, right. I could have gone the other way with it. One can always go the other way, but the trauma was the break and the continuity of your work. And also you so, saw that the continuity of the development of your abstraction um, dead-ended in some way, right. uh, exhausted. So uh, the trauma is crucial. In Eisenman, what makes the work click, if you want to say that, or emotionally evocative, is the sense of the difficulty of her situation as a gay lesbian. Yeah. Okay, so this is crucial that her work deals with this. Um, and she was initially picked up by uh, the gay culture. Her early collectors were two major, uh, ma two major collectors. Um, but uh, my point is that in a lot of modern art, uh, there is this sense of some kind of traumatic break. Uh, and uh, if you think even, let's say, of Cubism in the early period, there is something that leads it that you can read reinterpret it if you want, you know, getting away, being new and all of this kind of thing, but something has to lead that, okay? And my own sense, if I may say so, of the larger trauma, if I can use that way of speaking, of the quote, modern artist, uh, was uh, signaled by Baudelaire already uh, in the uh, uh, heroism of uh, modern artists where he spoke of modern art uh, we spoke of the flaneur figure, the observer, coming in at a time when aristocracy was going out and democracy was not yet fully there. Now we are in a situation of the democracy, total democracy of art, okay, which in another way of putting it as postmodern, say anything goes, okay, in yeah. democracy anything goes whatsoever, uh, it gets its hearing, whatever, somebody will listen or, <coughs> or see it or not. <coughs> now the problem is that uh, Anything goes just to a certain limit. I would say that's one source of democratization, and that's what we're fighting against here. And <clears throat> the people who push abstraction, trying to control it, that's the new aristocracy of art. <clears throat> but there's also <clears throat> another thing that I think is a problem. Uh, Baudelaire was working in the Paris, which was one of the most modern cities of the world at that time, Paris and London. And the advent of industrialism was crucial. It was a major threat to art, okay? And 
Photography, quote, is an industrial art, if you want. Thank you very much. As an industrial art. Uh, so uh, you have all these pressures on the individual artist, what T.S. Eliot called the individual talent. You're living in a world that is becoming industrialized. We're living in what is now called, and called for the technological society. So you're making art in a technological society, okay? Uh, and you're making art in a, quote, democratic society, whatever the hell that means, anything goes society. Uh, and uh, the question is, you know, how do you hold your individual own and appeal to other individuals who want to hold their own uh, and who are more than sort of cultural tourists? Uh, and I think it's all sort of slightly hit and miss. Okay, you don't know who's going to respond to your art. Uh, I do believe that all art that has some, what I would call a core to it, uh, an aesthetic core, an existential core, will find its audience. But what we're looking at now is the art world wants art that has mass appeal. Okay, so you get a performance art. You get a bronze. What does mass appeal mean? Well, you sit naked in the Museum of Modern Art, okay, and you pretend to be a guru, okay, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, so I think there is a does large that quandary that's here that's a part, that figurative art is only part of it. And I don't think it's just figurative art that's a part of it. Um, so I, I think the artist is in a very difficult and desperate situation, despite the fact that everybody's an artist. You know, as, as Boyce said, uh, you know, but we're all artists, hey, so whatever the hell that means. You know, of course, you know, just, you know, find, what, what, what did I find? What should I find to call a work of art? Uh, so that's the situation. And what we're trying to do is individual to individual, okay? That's, I think, the only way it will find the click. Here's the thing. Go ahead. I was just going to say there's an interesting contradiction in what you're describing the contemporary art world and the mass appeal. Mm -hmm. Because they're repeatedly frustrated by the fact that it actually doesn't have any mass appeal. Um, and that's sort of the weird well, propaganda-esque aspect of it. Like, I remember reading a story when I was in London. There's the painting that I'm sure you guys hate, which is the beheading of Lady Jane Grey, I believe is the oh, one by that Della Roche. By Della Roche, yeah. yeah. And this by painting... By, by, by Figures, sorry, in front of that this painting is an interesting story, right? They put this on display in, I think, the National Gallery in the 70s, and it was hated, the critics hated it, everybody hated it, hated it, hated it. It had the longest lines of any painting they'd ever shown. They had to replace the floor, supposedly, after it was up. So many people came to see it. I think now Bouguereau is the top-selling postcard in all the museums. I believe Odd Nerdrum probably, I think he sells more books than any other artist in the world. So you have this situation, and then you have what they're saying actually has popular appeal that doesn't really seem to have popular appeal. It seems to have appeal within a particular community. But then you have the Thomas Kincaid problem, so you don't want And to that, there. I'll just go out on a limb there because I'm going to be postmodern and accepting of everybody. He captured something that a lot of people loved. They loved it. They flipped out. He captured their vision of the perfect American dream with our little cabin. Well, so and does they Trump. loved it. And so does Trump. Donald Trump I mean, does the same if thing. We're that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. Know. You know? I, 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 I don't, I've never been a fan of, you know, popular appeal, you know, I mean, so it's got popular appeal. I mean, uh, I, I listen to the radio at home, you know, and, you know, it's on serious radio, and it's some rock and roll station, and every two minutes the same song comes up, and it's like, what the hell is this about? You know, I mean, if you wanted to really shorten someone's memory and make sure that they never thought outside of this little box, you keep bringing back that memory of when they were 14 and they first heard that song. And then it comes back again in an hour or two. And then again in another hour or two. And again in another hour or two. Or you go to a classical music station, and all you hear, at first they chop the pieces up, so you have like a half of a, a, set of a, of a, a movement of a symphony, but just the most popular part of it. And that's all you hear, and that's classical music, you know? So that's all you get. Or if you want opera, you know, there's the blind tenor, you know, Andre Bocelli, but there's nobody else. There's nobody else. There's no Gigli, there's no Caruso, there's no, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Caruso. There's no, there's no uh, Corelli, there's no Pavarotti. Well, there is a little Pavarotti, a little more, too much of him. But you know what I mean? It's a, everything is a sound bite. Everything is reduced to a bite, a bite of some sort. And that's all we can digest. 
I remember doing, I was doing these paintings, and some guy came up, this is years ago, he said, I don't know why you'd spend so much time on those paintings. People don't have that much time to look at anymore. Right. And I said, well, damn it, I don't care, because I'm not painting for them. I'm not communicating. I don't think, I, I can communicate better with my cell phone, you know? I can express myself better by combing my hair a certain way. Painting does not communicate, and painting is not about self-expression. Well, it is about those things, but those are byproducts. Primarily, it's about self-enlightenment. I do it to enlighten myself, and then when I exhibit them, it's wonderful when people actually look at what I've done and they can follow sort of what I'm doing. But I'm not going to dumb down my ideas to communicate to the masses. I don't want to do that. I'll never do that. I, I mean, why, would I, why would anyone want to do that? It's like the theory of the, 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 the I don't know. Uh, uh, well, I think we're gonna, <laughs> but I think those are the main arguments that are actually used against figure of art too. We're, we're talking about a mass culture. Sort of we're talking things. about mm. making art in a mass culture. Right. And part of what a mass culture does is it indoctrinates conformity. Okay. So who are the real heroes in this society? Who are the most rewarded people? Sports stars. Think of how much money they make. And Hollywood entertainers. Think of the amount of money they make. Okay. Mr. Sanders wants to go after Wall Street. Uh, I suggest he go after some of these Hollywood stars. Who is this male star who I heard was making $80 million a year? This guy who played Chaplin or something, whatever his name is. You know, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, that's right. $80 million a year. No, but he deserves it. He's good. <laughs> I knew you were really I'm with joking. it, Vincent. I'm joking. I knew you were really with it. You're really with it. So, you know, that's the opiate of the masses, excuse me, you know, that's the, op that's the new religion. Entertainment is the new religion, conforms, etc. That's, that's where we're at. And uh, what we're here about is we are heretics. We are, we are really heretics here. Um, odd, whether you like these particular pieces or not, or you think it's a come down from where he was. It's, a her it's heresy, you know. Yes, it sells. But I, I'm willing to bet that people buy it for, quote, the wrong reasons, which happen to be the right reasons also, because, like, it's a human figure and sort of got a little suffering in it, but not too much, uh, you know, uh, and so forth. So I don't think there's any escape, and I think your way is the way to do it. But I would point out that, in fact, you do have a public, you do have an audience, uh, you're not completely isolated. What we have to accept is that we're involved in a minority enterprise, like it or not. Okay, and it, art is no longer has the status that it had in the Renaissance. It just doesn't have it. it looks like it has it because there are all these museums all over, right, right. you know, but it just doesn't have it. Those museums are entertainment centers, right. and they're places for storing wealth. Works of art, paintings are the most portable assets. If you read the accounts of the opening of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, they mention collectors. And the works that are there are given by collectors under certain specific conditions, okay, and they're to move around. I mean, just read the accounts very carefully. It's quite interesting. All the collections are there, and one writer had the courage to say, hey, this work is sort of old news. You know, like there was no curiosity, no independent curatorial vision, no taking a risk here, showing a little this, that. They do have great photography, okay, but that was not featured, okay. It was not featured, okay. So they went for the big blockbuster auction price art. You know. So they had a show, the opening show was the homage, as I mentioned to, uh, his name escapes me now. Uh, no, not Sarah, the uh, color guy. Uh, Ellsworth Kelly. 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 Okay. And the same week in the auction results, there were complaints that his works had only gone for two and a half million dollars. Okay. That was inexpensive. Uh, and below what they, I'm, I'm, I'm reporting accurately. I, I sort of collect this kind of thing, sort of my sociological curiosity about the strange world I inhabit sort of <laughs> peripherally. Uh, you know, uh, and it's really quite fascinating. And then Gerhard Richter, you remember, he, he had a work for about 36 and a half million, 36.2, I think it was. And he said, oh, that was too much. But he was very happy for it. And then he declared it was a bad work. So fuck the collector, you see. So there's the artist privileging himself again, saying he's out of it. But meanwhile, he's making works that keep selling for 36 whatever million 
I don't know what he's doing with the money exactly. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, buying German bonds, which are negative return. Now. <laughs> Just two days ago, they went negative return. I, I think. I think. Uh, for time's sake, we should start to take some questions Absolutely. from the the audience. <laughs> Okay. Um, does anyone? Does anybody have any questions for anybody? You first. Yes. Um, you didn't really talk about hyper-realistic um, painting. Why? Why do you think it's so popular in the contemporary art world? And do you think it's more popular than realistic painting, or? Is there a reason for that? Because it's more like it's closer to digital work. Who do you consider hyper-realistic? You mean Chuck? Uh, I'm thinking of Rudolf Stengel, for example, who's oh, at the Whitney. There's always been, yeah. you know, those that that contingent who or is a slave Richter. to the photograph. Right. It's just yeah, it's easy to be impressed with that kind of skill. It's there's also the thing about sports that you mentioned earlier, and I was. The other night, somebody had a basketball game on, and I looked and I was going, wow, okay, this is really interesting. This is super interesting. There's like 100,000 people that showed up to see this. And in the end, there's nothing really functional being done. The ball goes through a hole, but they all show up to see it because I think human beings really like, going back to, okay, here's another digression. Monkeys like to watch TV. They really like monkey porn. The only thing more than monkey porn they like is alpha monkeys on TV. And I think humans and monkeys being monkeys ourselves, we really like to watch people that are good at something. It's like very deeply embedded in us. And I think maybe that's some of the appeal of hyperrealism is somebody can look at it and say, wow, look at that. They're so good. They're so good. It looks just like a photo. And then they come to the studio sometimes if you really paint it on it and they go, wow, that looks just like a photo. And you think, you know, damn, they can't believe they said that. I'm insulted now. I'm going to leave. But that's a real compliment, you know, like to, uh, to I think most people that don't really know about art, they're like, yeah, that looks like a photo. And that's this great display of skill. So you can kind of become like a hero that way, you know? I had a guy, when I was at PS1, I had a guy come into the studio. They would come in, you know, from off the street. And uh, this guy was looking at my paintings. He goes, nah, what do you call that? Is that it's a picture? Is it a, is it a, is it a photo? What, what is that? And I said, it's a painting. Like, a painting? Yeah, a painting. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was I'm not, not a big deal, but it was just very funny, actually. <laughs> I don't know. I think that it's again. It's just you. You. I really think you can teach a chimpanzee to do stuff like that. Uh, I'm not Gerhard Richter though. I think Gerhard Richter actually is engaged with the the uh, dialogue between painting and photography in a, in a significant way, like Chuck Close is. But a lot of these photo real and, and not Richard Estes either, who I think is a very good painter. You know. But a lot of these people who do these ultra-smooth computer one of the reasons I started like caking my paintings with paint was that I wanted to bring them as far away from the computer screen that I could. Rather than invest even more and more in my, I, Van Eyck already did it, better than anyone could do it, you know? I don't need to be first in finesse. Like Velasquez said, I'd rather be second in prudence than first in finesse, you know? Well, the familiar is always familiar. And if you make it very familiar, you're comfortable. So you're sort of comfortable with that. It doesn't challenge your sense of what is real. Say surrealism tra challenges your sense of reality, uh, how things look. Uh, there's no fantasy in it. And there's something comfortable about a world without fantasy. I think there's a Shakespeare character who everything great said, oh, if I could only not have bad dreams, you know, it would be great, you know. So we, we don't want bad dreams, and there's no bad dreams in Kincaid, you know. Um, uh, I think the underside of Kincaid, nightmarish, nightmarish <laughs> but it's, it's Sherwood Anderson did that kind of world, and he showed they're all slightly crazy underneath. Remember Sherwood Anderson? Uh, so, uh, you know, people go for comfort, and I think people go to these big sports events because we're all social, and it's great to lose your identity for a while, your individuality, okay? And one of the things that's uh, pointed out by Freud, among other people, uh, is in a crowd, uh, conscience is diffused, okay, so you have no responsibility. So, okay, so that's why a lot of these riots will happen. An individual won't do things like that, okay. 
So people forget who they are in the crowd, you know, um, and you know, it's great. And then you go home and you're exhausted and you don't have to think about your own life anymore. You know, it's as simple as that. Um, okay. I might also... You the world of dailiness, in Heidegger's term, you really thicken the world of all daily kind of dailiness. And you don't have to pay attention to anxiety, you don't have to pay attention to death, you don't have to pay attention to the fact that you're having bad bowel movements, you don't have to pay attention to the fact that you can't get it up, you don't have to pay attention to the fact that your wife doesn't quite like you, and you don't quite like her, and why the hell did you have children in the first place? You don't have to pay attention to any of those things. You're just watching that ball move, you know, that's it. Um, I just want to add um, that it's it's always interesting to me, the, uh, the artists, the painters in this case, that students um, uh, that the, the kind of conversations that, 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 that students have around relevant artists um, and Sting, people like Stingle are not, are not part of that. It was re really interesting. We had a, a discussion about, um, uh, well, Marilyn Minter came up and um, she was, I think, paired with Gerald Davis. And Marilyn Minter seemed, um, you know, it's very fun to look at, but it was, there, there's no struggle there. So the student as, an ex exemplar of the the thinking um, agitated uh, mind um, person is not going to care about a stingle. So I think of stingle as for collectors and not part of the art, art conversation. Well, I want to thank you for everything that you've said in this discussion, and I'm glad that I made it even though I was late. But I have to say that I found it incredibly frustrating especially when you were discussing Odd Nordrum's work, because as far as I know, the only person on the panel who has spent a significant amount of time with Odd that has lived with him is David Molesky, who was living with him even longer than I did. And I feel like a lot of things that you alluded to or glossed over or were mentioned later were not focused upon when you were talking directly about his work and why he has made the choices he has made. You didn't, I did not hear it addressed that he studied with Joseph Boys. I didn't hear it addressed that he actually is like very well aware of what's happening in the contemporary scene. He constantly is looking at what younger artists and artists in museums, contemporary museums are now making. He just chooses to not interact with that because he disagrees with it. And he and I disagree on a lot of things and frankly he doesn't like my work anymore but he respects the fact that I choose to make the work I make now. Um, so I wish that David had been able to speak more about what he thought about the discussion around Odd's work is, has been, and is now, because frankly, a lot of what Odd is dealing with now that's now public, which has been happening for more than 10, 15 years, even the first day that I lived with him in 2008 or seven, there were helicopters flying over his house taking photographs, and I did not understand what was going on until it became public 10 years later. Mm -hmm. He alluded to it, but he was respectful of the process he was going through legally and did not go into it with the students. Mm -hmm. So also, the thing is, a lot of what he's dealing with now, he already addressed 10, 20 years ago through the small painting that he made of himself being beheaded or him being killed multiple times. And so the work that I see now that you're saying is failing to address his current situation, I see it as a man who's trying to achieve peace and has already addressed all of the things that he's been dealing with his whole life because now they've come to a head, but they've been going on for decades. And he's already gone into it and maybe now he's trying to achieve peace and not let these problems fester anymore in his life and in his work. And I'd really like to hear more from David about what he thinks about what the conversation's been like so far around Odd's work. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't foresee him being kind of slammed in the way that he was in the panel. Um, but yeah, um, the, the work of this show is addressing his experiences as an individual in the world and, you know, this sort of the, um, 
and I think his work has been engaged with that for a very long time. This, I, you know, he grew up in Norway, where you know, in kindergarten, uh, children are taught uh, Yante's law, Yante Loven, which is this concept that you know, no individual should uh, succeed and be you know extraordinary and stand above the rest of society. And and, and his uh, and he. He kind of he very quickly broke that rule in his you know his early twenties and became a, a known figure um, outside of the social support of of Norway, which, in my understanding, is like more than fifty percent state jobs, uh, and they've they have a history of going after uh, their public figures who become famous outside of that system. So, you know, Edvard Munch, for example, you know, he got a, a grant to go to Europe and became friends with the Foves. And when he came back to Norway, they totally turned their back on him, didn't support him or buy his work until, strangely enough, after they put him through uh, electric shock therapy and, you know, most of the blacks in his paintings dropped out. Um, and we don't even, you know, pay attention to those paintings anymore. So, you know, Odd, Odd has a, you know, in his paintings there is a, a narrative and he even self-published a book called uh, How We Treat Each Other, which is a collection of dramas and a lot of the dramas uh, contain his own personal narrative disguised in, you know, under different names of characters. So, um, yeah, what, he, what I think he's doing is very brave. Um, and he's done it against a lot of resistance and lack of support from his country and uh, the contemporary art world. So, um, can I say something? Too? Yeah. Okay, I'll say something more too because being the youngest person on the panel, I'm not going to tell people who have been thinking about this a lot longer than I have what they should think True. about Odd Nirjum, but yeah. I'll just throw out what I think about it. I mean, I think he's a giant. There's no doubt about it. The guy's an absolute fucking giant. You can't really take it away from him. Um, and I do think something that Donald said earlier was very interesting, that there's a degree of alienation in these paintings, a large degree of alienation. And I actually find it really interesting. I think the story of an intelligent, sensitive, powerful artist who has become incredibly alienated in his relationship with the world over the years is actually a really interesting story that I see in these paintings. I find it fascinating. Um, and I do see that when he was younger, he painted large murder of Andreas Bader, the refugees on the raft. He then went into a period where they were still very technically polished and high contrast, and he was dealing more with his own mythology that seemed to come from Iceland and from Norway and these landscapes and these people existing alienated in these landscapes with a lot of dark Freudian stuff going on under the surface. And in these, I do think you see people who have turned completely away from the world and are turning into each other, whether they're eating each other, whether they're finding some comfort in each other. And I do think that's a powerful, interesting statement that is also a little difficult to handle maybe from a even a modernist or contemporary point of view, because the idea of the artist has been that we're supposed to be engaged all the time, we're supposed to be commenting on the world. And I think it's, to me, they're very poetic. I mean, he's giving the world the finger, and I think that's valid too. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that that is a great painting by any stretch of the imagination. However, uh, a lot of great painters, as I said before, have made paintings that were not so great. And even when they are not doing the job that we hope they'll do, they're telling us something that is very interesting anyway. Well, they're telling us in this case about the things that he's uh, in, th in the thrall of. He's in the thrall of the kneecaps. He's in the thrall of the ear. Kneecaps, no, but are, wonderful things, kneecaps yeah. are wonderful things, but they cannot, unless it's a painting about a kneecap, they cannot I think hijack that, the idea. I think that this painting is, the first thing you s one notices is that it's tremendously awkward. And yet, there are many paintings by, even not coloristically, but like Ray John, or other, or even uh, Gustave Moreau, or uh, people who, there are awkwardnesses in the paintings, and sometimes those things have, uh, the artist will push themselves to allow themselves to do the awkward thing in order to, 
charge some other thing. In other words, like, Eric Fischel is an artist who I admire tremendously. I've always admired him. And he is an artist who dare, will dare himself to do things that really should not be done in painting, uh, you know, by any stretch, academic stretch of the imagination. And yet, when he nails it, he really nails it. And he nails it repeatedly, just like Odd has nailed it repeatedly in the early works. I, I, you know, whether he's a giant or whether he's not is not for me to say. You know, I respect him as a, as a, as a comrade, as a person who is a fellow painter who devoted his life to this thing that he believed in the face of total odds, you know. You've got to admire that. It's well, yeah, but, 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 but we do have to uh, you know, honor, um, there, there, there's so much trickery, there's so much fakery that um, we, we have to honor those people who, won't, who aren't lying to us. But who, who in this time is not lying yeah. to us? <laughs> well, so, <laughs> Jerome Witkin is not lying. I think, I think Jerome Witkin is painting allegory and history painting that's dealing with contemporary reality and not doing this pretty picture with pretty faces in it and miss the allegory that really has nothing to do with anything except look at me, I could do this which is what Nerdman is doing. You know, some, some art is and about Wittgen what... And is totally unrecognized for the ambition of what he's doing and in the technical means also that is truly masterful, but institutions and the art uh, establishment does not want to dare put that kind of work forward. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, institutional um, lack of support for serious representational figurative art. That's really where, the, I mean, I went to San Francisco recently and I saw exactly what you're talking about. Corporate, and it's all about the collectors right. and the safe way in which they collect. I mean, right. rooms of big pictures about nothing. Right. Lots of Ellsworth Kelly. Right. Lots of Gerhard Richter. Right. Lots of, um, what's his face, the German guy who does the big... Basil, uh, uh, Kiefer. No, Kiefer. 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 Anselm Kiefer. Lots of that. Lots and lots of it. Kiefer's a great But team. nothing, but not a single work of art in that whole huge museum that really dealt with humans and history. And there are painters doing this, but they're getting absolutely no institutional uh, support. And I can say this also as being a curator of a small museum who's struggling to organize an exhibition of Rick Witkin's work. And this is never, it's not, never going to be in the new museum. It's never going to be shown in the Museum of Modern Art. And the Metropolitan Museum wouldn't do it until, like they did with Freud, finally. There was enough support so that they dare put up a show of an artist like Lucian Freud. You have to outlive your uselessness. That's what, you know, instead of like, you know, yeah, I mean, well, you know, I think the gentleman is right, uh, absolutely on target. Uh, there is an institutional problem, and uh, these institutions are curiously ossified. Uh, and uh, they've got money blinders on them, uh, basically. And, you know, we see everything through the lens of money. Uh, you cannot think autonomously, independently. You can't get your own judgment. Going back to Odd and this work, I happen to agree with Julie. Uh, I would say it's insipid, apart from anything else. And to me, this raises an interesting ex question about this exhibition. I sense that it's not edited. That is, I think an artist doesn't always produce what is the greatest thing. The artist needs critical judgment in relation to his or her own production. And I sense there's a failure of this. And I suspect, this is pure hypothesis, that his grandeur is so great that he can't have any critical judgment about what he produces anymore. That he's, he's so alienated and his grandeur, his alienation is part of his grandeur. I am different. I am, you know, this whatever special artist, and no doubt he's done some important works. Don't, don't get me wrong about this. But there's no longer any critical judgment going here. I mean, I think this could be a tighter show, much more interesting myself. I, that's just my own judgment when we disagree. But I don't think he has any critical second thoughts about what he's doing. Okay. 
You know, I was going to say in regards to what you were saying, it's uh, it, it is really, it is incredibly frustrating. You know, like I, I have some kind of reputation, and people say, "Oh, well, you're in these collections," and I get proud to be able to put on my resume that I'm in the, you know, the Metropolitan, I'm in this, and you know, the Herschel and things like that. But in every one of those museums, I'm in storage including the Hirshhorn with my painting of the uh, cocaine with all the books, in storage. Uh, my alma mater, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, you know, they own a big triptych of mine, in storage. The Boston Museum, the acquisition of a whole major collection, kept a few paintings, luckily two of them were mine. One of them appeared in the, in the uh, uh, dining room, and then it was moved to the coat room before it eventually disappeared in storage. <laughs> So, I mean, these paintings are there, and I know people want to see them, and I, Jerome is a dear friend of mine, and he, I understand his frustration. I mean, we've talked about this frustration, you know? Uh, I think Donald's absolutely you know, right. But, 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 these, but, these collectors, you know, who sits on the board of the collections committees? Who sits on the exhibitions committees? You know, who decides they're going to have an exhibition of, say, John Curran's work? Well, I think it's time to have an exhibition of John Curran's work. Well, he's kind of new on the scene, but you know, no, I think we should, and a few other people own his paintings, and so they decide to get together, and let's do an exhibition of John Curran. They're holding zero lives, just like Sachi does with his show. You know, he does the show, he buys a, a spot in the Brooklyn Museum, does the show, everyone's screaming about it, he de de acquisitions it as soon as it's over. Just it happens over and over again. Just introduce a concept which may perhaps or for some minimum clarification of the situation. Uh, famous German thinker, sociologist, Ternis made a distinction between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, community and society. Very famous distinction. He argued that in a society, all relations, he's about modern, are contractual. Okay. Okay, museums are contractual. Communities, he says, are organic relations in which everybody knows each other. Anthropologists a small group. Anthropologists have shown that ideal kind of community is about 150 people. These have been studies, 150, 160, give or take, okay? These are people with some common ground, common interest. Uh, they may not know each other, but you go into small communities, everybody knows each other, say hello if you've ever been in small towns, whether you like it or not, okay? So I think what we're talking about here is a kind of community, and I think these museums are uh, societies, that is, they are contractual organizations, okay, they are contractual organizations. And I think there's something else that's going on that informs what's going, what's, what's going on in museums. Um, there was this recent show of Kay Bo in the National Gallery in Washington, an artist I admire very much went down there, saw it, wrote about it, uh, and I was reading, um, I'm sorry? Kay Bo, yeah, excuse me. Uh, and, uh, I was reading about his life. He was a very wealthy man. Um, he became affiliated with the Impressionists partly through accident. He was rejected by the Salon, then picked up by the Impressionists, became their supporter, friends. He paid the rent on Monet's studio and so forth and so on. A uh, close friend of Renoir and all of that. When he passed away, um, he left this huge collection to the state of France. And they rejected it. They rejected it. A lot of the works ended up uh, in the United States. Some of the major works, uh, the famous rainy days in Chicago and so forth. Uh, and why did they reject it? Uh, because at that time, the contractual world, that is the society, was so-called academic realism, whatever you want to call it at that time, that French art, okay? So that was the contract. They rejected it for that reason, okay? Um, the museum, the Metropolitan Museum, uh, a number of years ago was offered by the Havermeyer collection of Impressionist works, one of the earliest collections, very smart collection, very you know, individual collectors, had a kind of community situation. The MEC rejected it because it was, quote, too modern, or who the hell knows why they rejected it, okay? And the work, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, the Columbia University was offered, was offered this if they build a museum for it, okay, and they didn't do it, so it went to the Met and, and Columbia got the Havermeyer Building in Chemistry instead. The Dreyer collection, which is a different kind of collection altogether, Catherine Dreyer, Duchamp kind of thing, was offered to the Museum of Modern Art. Remember this? Not too long ago, relatively speaking, okay, rejected, it's in Yale. It's in the Yale Museum. So what you see in museums 
is a kind of conservatism hesitancy. Okay, now the difference now is that these works have, quote, proved their value, whatever. They've become economic valuable, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all afraid of losing out now. So they will spend enormous sums, and the only people who have enormous sums are big capitalists, and big donors. That's where all this comes from. Okay, enormous sums uh, of money to get work because for whatever reason it's trendy. They don't want to miss the boat. Now the interesting question is why are they missing the boat with this work? And I would say for a very simple reason, it has not entered the contractual society. It is still part of the communal society. Nordstrom is communal. He has this group of artists around him. I think all the artists here are communal. Figurative art is still a quote, a communal art, if you please. Okay. Uh, and I think that's the issue. And how to break that, I don't know. Well, my own opinion is the only way to do it is to have another museum, simply a museum devoted to figurative art, period. That is, you need a contractual type institution to focus this. And then people will pay attention and say, ah, it's special. And then maybe the other museums will do this. They, they tried to do that in the 70s and early 80s in New York. It didn't, didn't work. work. Also, you know, it's it very interesting. There's work. also a prejudice, you know, most of the German work, the very few German works in Museum of Modern Art, there's some Beckmans. This was acquired when Hitler was deaccessioning, as it were, stuff, went through Zurich, okay? It's all French, 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 not the Germans. Too existential, whatever, too insane, you know, Meshuggah and all that stuff, you know? <laughs> and, and so there's another issue there as well. And the, the art in the San Francisco Museum now, it's <coughs> very safe using it's even safer than the academic art because it's even more reified. Yeah. Yeah. It's even more reified. Yeah, exactly. If you compare some of the Vic English Victorians and the French, there's a variety of going on there. Yeah. You know, this is a sort of tighter, narrower kind of thing that's going on now. Right. Thank you. <laughs> I, there, there are a lot of young people out there. Um, I don't uh, pay a lot of attention to them. <laughs> <laughs> No, I do, because they're my students. There are lots of people out there. You know, when you're young, in our society, we're like looking at the youngest, the youngest, youngest. I want to look at the older, you know, because the young, yeah, you know, yeah, they're, they're, it's fresh in a way, supposedly, but it's also sophomoric often, you know? And I prefer someone who's actually worked for a long time time and what they've been doing. First of all, painting's not like you know, installation art or anything like that, where you can really figure out how to do it in a semester. You know, painting is something that takes many years, many years, to get even close to what you want to do, you know? But the rewards are fantastic, I think. The rewards are fantastic if you stick with it. That's why I prefer to look at the work of people who are seasoned rather than younger. My question is, in, I think figurative work, in order to go forward, or just looking at it now, I think it has a unique dilemma of, of using a skill set or working out of a tradition, but it needs to operate with a different criteria for value, yeah. for what is good. Yeah. It is yeah. not, you know, and that's the dilemma, because you are using one, is coming out of a tradition that has built into it a, a value judgment, a way to judge what is good work and what is not good work. And what I think what needs to happen is a way to take how you're using and working out of the tradition without that criteria for judging its worth. That's right. And that yeah, is absolutely. why you're lost at sea. That's why we're all lost at sea. Because we, and that's why it takes hundreds of years or whatever your lifetime is, 80 years. <laughs> because you're searching. I think for figurative work to go forward, you need to really dig in for your own criteria for is this good or not good, but still, you're still working out of a tradition that is, it's, the, the, the weight of that value judgment is heavy on you. And I, I think that the work that, you know, anyway, so I, I want to discuss a separation of, in a sense, the skill set that you have, separate that from the value judgment of, is it, it's, you know, there's, there, there are two separate things there. I there's one thing that has, has struck me a lot about in, in art education is that, uh, and it, it comes back to these atelier systems and also the, the sort of uh, ways that certain people learn, you know, how to paint in a classical manner or stuff like that. Uh, you know, 
I think that when you when you see it happening in schools, you realize that there's more of a prison involved with uh, learning certain types of skills because you've been sort of programmed or you believe that this is what good art has to proceed from. These this group of technical skills, you know, not being aware of the fact that sometimes those tech when you really, you know. F you know, groove your brain with those kinds of technical skills, it's very difficult to escape from them and to think beyond that. So when I tell people, students, I say to them, you have two opportunities. Every time you make a mark on a canvas, you begin to commit yourself to something. And the more marks you put on, the more committed you are. Until finally you've built a room around yourself. Now, that room can be a prison or it can be an observatory. That's the trick to try to make the room that you're building multivalent, that it opens doors, it opens windows to a cosmos, it and doesn't you, close you off. your criteria for whether this is good or not is not referring beyond itself. It's not referring to Rembrandt. This is good because it looks like Rembrandt. No, Rembrandt was good because he looked like Rembrandt. Exactly. I mean, the criteria yeah. is within the work, and it's exceedingly hard. It's exceedingly I, hard. I think that's the dilemma of figurative art right now, is how to, how to find that. And it takes such courage and digging in, and nobody else is going to see it because it's not that criteria is not out there yet. Yeah, right. The, the, I mean, but think about the history of art. Think about how many painters there were. And they're all like, if you look at one of those pictures of the like, Pennsylvania Academy and the people working in the studios back in the 19th century, you know, they're all working on the figure and they're all doing a really good job, much better than anyone does in school now. But you know that they're not all good painters, and you know that none of them, virtually none of them, will ever have you know, accomplished anything of great value as painters, you know? So we're talking about a very small, small group of people in the history of painting that ever really, I mean, there are lots of painters, but very small group of them who actually do something that stops the clock. And they probably don't know if it's good or They think half the time this sucks because you're on that limb. Is this good or does this just totally suck? Actually, you know, you know Vincent, exactly I, don't, I don't like the way the you present that. Often, the better they are. I really don't like the way because what these people do, who are not the greatest, whatever you want to call them, uh, is they keep the whole thing going. They keep, they are the bedrock. They keep the whole thing flowing, okay? Can you you cannot simply them? dismiss them, okay? Yeah. Um, if you look at photographs of Matisse, which I've looked at of Matisse and his atelier, they're all women in there, okay? We don't know who these women are these days. Maybe we could track them down, but they kept it going, okay? Right, right, you're right. Uh, and I think what you say is very condescending, frankly, uh, uh, to these people. Uh, I think to your own students. Uh, and also, the okay. idea of a, of a prison, you, you're, you're, what your job is, whatever, yes, you want to make them all Michelangelo's, whatever, or Vincent's, but, uh, yeah. but what your job is, is to give them the means to become who they want to become, and that includes all kinds of knowledge. It's a situation of learning, okay? And My it is marvelous. Yes, there are many of them who are not going to you know, be outstanding. Yeah, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's an idea of pedagogy, that pedagogy actually accepts mediocrity. You know, it doesn't sort of encourage, if it encouraged them to d dig deep within themselves, you can bring it out. Your use of the word mediocrity is already condescending. There's no student in the student position who is mediocre or not mediocre. No, They're no. They're learning. The students They're are not learning. mediocre. The, You're getting it the wrong. No, the students the are not mediocre. The professors are not mediocre not either. The professors. They're trying to give certain information, no, 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 no. certain ways of doing Donald, things. I'm not saying, you know, I understand what you're saying, and I agree with you, and I know, I, maybe I've overstated it, but what I'm saying is that it's neither the students nor the teachers that are mediocre. It's simply that we have a kind of a culture of mediocrity living today in this world. And you've even expressed just tonight the fact that our society is, you know, accepting of things that are really ludicrous. That's another thing. I was responding to your idea of students. No, but I'm of not saying people students. people who are working there, that, that's what I respond to. I agree with you that there is a larger problem in mass society. But when you're in a school situation, you've got a, a dozen students or whatever you have in a class, 
you, if you think of them as mediocre, no, you're destroying them. No, no, I agree with you, and I've never done that as a teacher ever in my life. I think it's the absolute worst way to go about teaching. It's not the students who are mediocre. It's not the teachers who are mediocre. It's the system that encourages mediocrity. And that system is, in de is, 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 is problematic because it's, it's sort of demonstrative of a larger cultural problem of acceptance of, you know, it may be that painting, you know, if I open my Apple computer, I see the Brunelleschi's chapel more clearly than if I look at one of Odd's paintings. You know, the Renaissance could be someplace else right now, not in painting, but I still think that we can readdress the, the, the uh, agendas that we have as teachers so that we can create people who are more li literate in regards to painting, more, uh, more uh, have greater clarity about what painting is, what it can do. When we do that, we will be, do justice to the fact that these people, none of them, is mediocre. Okay. You know? I, That's I, what I mean about to say. That's what I'm talking about. No, I would never say that a student was mediocre and dismiss them. That, that's something that Rosalind Krauss might do, but I wouldn't. Well, do you were that. talking. You were, I was responding. Uh, I was responding to the fact that you talked about all these people who worked in the past. Uh, you know, and you sort of dismiss them. And I don't buy that. I go. We go to the Met. They have a room of small works, of restored 19th century works. They're quite fantastic. Yeah. They're not. They're not the greatest, whatever the hell that means. They're not Michelangelo, you know, with his muscular figures or whatever the hell they are. Uh, you know, uh, so that's not what they are. Who, uh, didn't didn't, didn't uh, Brancusi said they had too much muscle on them, too much fat on them? I think it was Brancusi who said about that criticism. They should have eaten more though. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it what seems like some of this is the need for figurative artists to justify themselves now too. Because I mean, in the past, you looked at a lot of work. It was everywhere. It was in Paris. You walked around Rome and Florence, and the work was all around you. And a lot of it wasn't Michelangelo. A lot of it wasn't great. But it adds so much to the world. You, it's everywhere. It's beautiful. It elevates you every time you see it. And if you don't have it, you have this. I mean, you walk outside, you won't see a damn thing because it's not there. Because we have no use for normal, for art, that's good. Maybe it's not great. Maybe it's not even worth being put under a spotlight on a podium in a museum, but it well, sure as hell makes the world. We're running out of Jeff time. Jeff Koons was a store next up. to the David. In the, in, yeah. Is that correct in, in Florence? Uh, Jeff Koons was installed there. I don't know if it's still up. Last summer. Oh, my brother Mark right. was there. He said there's something in the Piazza da Signoria that's like chrome. It might be uh, Jeff Koons. That was Jeff Koons, and there's the David. And you know, there's the Bologna and all that stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. And there's Jeff Koons. I thought that's extremely interesting. He had he had a a, a dirt puppy in uh, Versailles, I believe it was. Uh, you know, uh, it's very interesting. It, you know, all of this is culturally fascinating. I don't know, and it may be finally that some people are already thinking that the line between what we call a material culture and art has broken down. That art is simply, you know, one kind of material culture, as it were, or one kind of entertaining culture as well. It's the triumph of mediocrity. <laughs> Mediocre entertainers. It's the triumph of a curious kind of self-defeating indifference. Yeah. <laughs> it's the way I put it myself. Right. Well, yeah. I don't want to stay in the camera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.